For 20 years, I've been in a committed relationship with Final Cut Pro. It was my first non-linear editor and became the tool that I relied upon to create professional videos for myself and for clients. I remained steadfast through the version 10 update, a change in the software that caused many people to leave the platform and even launched this channel with the help of Final Cut Pro. But all that's changed. Recently, it's like I have fallen out of love. The lack of support for my favorite audio plugins, unsaturated color conversion, and frustrating integrations with the rest of my toolkit have caused me to look elsewhere. I think it's time that I admit the truth. This isn't working. Final Cut Pro in its current state has become a frustration to my creative workflow, not an asset. And as of last week, I'm another one of those Resolve users. I know it can be difficult to integrate new tools into your workflow, but over the next few videos, that's exactly what I'll be doing. In times like these, I believe it's important to understand the work you make is more important than the tools you use to create it. If Final Cut Pro meets your needs, then that's great. It met mine for over 20 years. But if anything I say here gives you pause, consider whether it might be worthwhile to know both platforms. The goal of this video isn't so much to sway you one way or the other, but rather to point out features that they both share and opportunities where Apple could take inspiration from other editors on the Macintosh platform. Resolve, it feels like, has clearly taken pointers from Apple, so why can't it be the other way around? Through that lens, I want to examine five areas where Final Cut Pro could take inspiration and improve. Final Cut Pro pitches a complete audio post-production suite as part of the default package. But I ask, is it actually professional? Or maybe the answer is, it's professional if you start out with inferior audio. It's great at cleaning up background noise, even if the resulting speech is a bit robotic. But what if you start out with audio that's already pristine? As some of you may know, I shoot a weekly video podcast called Craft and Process. It takes me into the spaces of respected makers to discuss their art and the unique spaces they create in. So far, I've spoken to a Main Street bookshop owner and co-founder of a brewery here in Colorado. And both spaces had their own unique challenges from an audio standpoint. Thankfully, my microphone of choice for these interviews is a Heil Sound PR40. This is a large diaphragm dynamic microphone that rejects almost every sound that doesn't originate from in front of the capsule. This leads to a very clean multi-channel audio mix out of the box without any processing, which you can hear playing now. Um, for me, this is a this has been a long play. Um, this isn't this definitely isn't new for for me or for us. Unfortunately, when I asked Final Cut to normalize this audio, it also chooses to perform heavy-handed noise and hum reduction, which makes the audio sound like this. Crafting process. Welcome. Yes. Thank you. Good to be here. So Michael, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about- I admit there is a mild whir caused by the air conditioner and the brewing equipment that is on the other side of that glass, but I don't think it's that distracting, even in the raw audio. In recent versions of Final Cut, it's also difficult to apply these audio fixes and then revert them later because they'll often show up again on export. In both recent episodes, I opted to handle the audio track entirely separately, exporting it to Logic for post-production before reintegrating it into the Final Cut timeline. This allowed me to have a cleaner, uncorrupted audio mix and all but guaranteed that Final Cut wouldn't distort it in the later phases of processing, but it also made it difficult to work with my Tentacle Sync E time code generators, which are on every camera. These small devices are the backbone of any multi-camera or long form podcast shoot. And I'll get back to that in a moment. But for right now, understand that if you have a separate audio editor in the mix, you often lose the metadata that is required to use these devices to their fullest. And that's frustrating. I've also lost access to many of my audio plugins, including compressors from Universal Audio and artistic effects from Sound Toys that you've no doubt heard in past videos. With the powerful core audio architecture that exists on Mac OS, I'm sure that I could route around these plugins being unsupported in Final Cut Pro. But do I really want to rely on a hack for my main production workflow? Deciding to build a workaround is a process that has bit me in the past, and I don't believe the situation is any different now. 
Resolve, by comparison, offers a fully featured digital audio workstation known as Fairlight. While it's no logic, it's far more capable than many of the audio tools shipped by default in Final Cut Pro, and it loads all of my plugins with zero hassle. From the built-in loudness meter, which helps a lot when you're mixing your film, to the full fader strip on every audio channel, I'm finding that Fairlight is a great companion for almost anything you'd want to do when mixing audio. It falls short if you try to use it for full music production, but that's what Logic is for. If Apple wants to remain competitive, here's what they should do. Either add a dedicated audio window to Final Cut Pro, which allows you to mix and manage the audio tracks separately from their video components, or make it easier to round trip audio to Logic for those of us who have a full mixing and mastering suite and would rather work in that environment. For now, until Apple improves the audio experience in Final Cut Pro, I think I'll be producing my shows, specifically ones that need both audio and video exports in Resolve. Speaking of time code, it's a must for multi-camera shoots and productions that go over that one hour mark. This is the Tentacle Sync E. It's a small timekeeping device that I install on my cameras and audio recorders to ensure they're all synced by the end of the shoot. I've written a longer form video on how I use the Tentacle Sync in my production workflow, including how I integrate it with my editor later on. So if you want the full download on that, subscribe. In theory, installing one of these devices on every camera and my multi-channel audio recorder means that I simply take all the files and drag them into the timeline. When I first started using these devices over a year ago, timecode support in Final Cut Pro was significantly lacking. And while I'm happy to report that timecode support in Final Cut Pro has now improved, it's still tricky if you have to involve other audio editing applications in your workflow. In contrast, DaVinci Resolve supports common timecode standards right out of the box. If you read the Apple community posts, you'll find this is something the company has been working on for quite some time. However, in true Apple fashion, the company attempted to strong arm many camera vendors into using a QuickTime specific timecode format in order to gain support in Final Cut Pro. It would seem to me, given that timecode support in Final Cut Pro has changed over the last year, that Apple has abandoned this approach and instead chose to support common timecode specifications like those that are supported by DaVinci Resolve. When I've tested the audio sync feature offered in Final Cut Pro against that that is also offered in DaVinci Resolve, I find Resolve's audio sync to be far more robust. It works in many cases where Final Cut Pro's audio sync has failed. I also happen to think this timecode support is too little, too late. If I have to involve a separate audio editor in my workflow, then I've already dramatically slowed down the production process. And that's not something that I need if I'm trying to make two videos a week. I've often said when you're making a video that you're creating an audio experience first. The video is an auxiliary. This analysis is supported by the number of commenters on my video who say my soothing tone of voice helped them learn more. In the case of Resolve versus Final Cut Pro, we're seeing this play out in a technical capacity. We're having a capable audio editor reduces the need to round trip audio to other programs, thereby allowing you to maintain a tighter leash on metadata as it goes through the entire production chain. This is something that DaVinci does incredibly well because it helps keep the focus on the story, not the software being used to make the story. And you would think that's something Apple would embrace. Before I started my color grading workflow in DaVinci, I would always question why professional colorists would prefer a baked, log-encoded 16-bit ProRes timeline as the main input for their critical color work. And now that I've had the chance to use DaVinci's advanced scene detection, frame accurate editor, and color pipeline, it's all so clear. In Final Cut Pro, there are two ways to adjust color. One is to apply adjustments to clips that are already in the timeline, and this works for both individual and compound clips. The other way is to use a text-like plugin called an adjustment layer, and apply your fixes and corrections to the adjustment layer, and then drag it out until it covers the desired scene. The problem with working in a clip-based workflow is that if you've applied your color space transform, which should be the final adjustment in your color grading workflow, 
it's difficult to see what that final result looks like while adjusting log settings deep in the compound clip. This is why many Final Cut Pro users chose to adopt the idea of adjustment layers. As I mentioned before, adjustment layers are a plugin based workflow that allows you to create overlays on the existing footage. The problem is, I don't think this workflow is officially supported. And if it is, Apple has shown signs of deprecating it in the future. So let's say you want to use the adjustment layer technique. It's easy and I understand. How would you go about that? You create an empty title in motion. This involves creating a blank title template in motion and then deleting any of the text content in that template. The problem I've found unfortunately comes downstream of this technique when you have to correct for the gamma that would be otherwise rendered correctly in a text layer that is actually now being rendered as a visual effect. And this is something that's true of both standardized adjustment layer plugins as well as the adjustment layers that I've built. The way that text is rendered to screen in Final Cut Pro is fundamentally different to that of other video clips. The problem is you find yourself constantly juggling the lie. Am I rendering a text layer? Or am I rendering a layer that I've told Final Cut is text, but should otherwise be mixed in to the overall video composition? I want you to take a look at this sequence, shot on my Sony FX3 and edited in Final Cut Pro. Notably, there is no color grading that has happened in this clip. Only the standard color space transform from Sony S-Log3 Gamut 3 to Rec. 709. I can only hope this is evident on YouTube, but if I look at these two clips in my grading suite, one where I performed the color space transition in Final Cut Pro, and the other one where I performed the color space transition in DaVinci Resolve, I was prepared to tell you they looked fundamentally the same, but they don't. The two programs yielded fundamentally different results. Resolve's translation of the S Gamut 3 color space appears to be richer and with more contrast than that from Final Cut Pro. Although oddly, there are areas of the image where Final Cut Pro tended to oversaturate the highlights. And I tend to prefer the DaVinci look on the whole. Resolve also tends to embrace a more rigid approach to color management, allowing you to work in stages. Since I returned to filmmaking, I've had this hope that I could keep both edited and colored versions of my films separately. The idea is that if I ever needed to remaster for an HDR color space, I would have the tools to do so. In Resolve, I found that it's a single click to turn off all of the changes downstream from my original log correction. In Final Cut, it takes six. And like I said before, it's very difficult to see the final output for a Rec. 709 color transform when you're working on corrections deep in a compound clip. This is something that DaVinci Resolve with their node system completely circumvents. And you would think Apple would want to adopt as well. It's too early to tell how much time this will save me overall. But I believe as I'm stepping back into the world of filmmaking, it's important that I focus on what I can. Proper exposure in camera and being able to grade for any future deliverable formats. On the topic of media management, it feels like I've lost more media to the Final Cut library than to any other storage system combined. One of my pet peeves is the ability to copy files to the Final Cut library a setting which you seemingly cannot change after the library has been initially created. If I understand correct, you have to copy files into the library at creation or make sure the path on disk to those files never changes. And that becomes far more difficult than you might imagine as your media collection expands. A few days ago, I found myself looking for a specific piece of archival footage on my network attached storage when I encountered the project that I thought contained most of that media. It was almost 60 gigabytes after all, so surely the source footage was in there somewhere. Unfortunately, it didn't take me long to realize I was looking at 60 gigabytes of proxy media and render files and little else. This is especially frustrating because moving a Final Cut Pro library requires dealing with huge files. In this case, 60 gigabytes of renders but no source media. And it brings up two questions. One, what do I do when disk space becomes low and I need to migrate these libraries to a different location? And what if I want to begin collaborating with another filmmaker after the library is created? 
In my case, I'm unable to work off of the network volume. I have to copy the library file to an external hard drive to be able to edit it, at least with great enough performance. I don't think it's a stretch to say that managing that 60 gigabyte file just to handle renders and proxies is an untenable situation for many creatives. Resolve, on the other hand, prefers to keep media and project files separate rather than mixing them together into a single large database. In Resolve, a project is just that. It's metadata that it knows about files in the media pool and the layout of those files on the timeline. A timeline is again its own separate file and can be exported separately from the project if you want to give someone access to a portion of a project, but not the entire project itself. Keeping metadata and media storage separate is a crucial feature that many pro media applications like Logic and Pro Tools have long since adopted, and it eases the process of working together. This is something that Apple should absolutely repeat. This next section, rendering and exports, is something that I thought would never make the list because Apple's media encoding engine is dialed. I was prepared to write that in a basic export test, both pieces of software were essentially equal because Resolve was using the same media export pipeline as Final Cut, right? Remember that driving sequence that I showed you earlier? Exporting to 4K for social media platforms, which involves using a media encoder, took just over a minute in compressor. Resolve, by comparison, handled the same project in 20 seconds. I ran both benchmarks 10 times and I was impressed by the consistency. On larger projects, the difference between Final Cut and Resolve is sometimes a few minutes across an hour long timeline. Now, while it may be tempting to extrapolate from this result that Resolve will make you a faster editor overall, that's not always the result. It's more of a trade-off. Final Cut Pro will attempt to render some of the more complex video effects in the background while Resolve will make you stop, perform a specific render for that effect, and then proceed. In the past, I've been allowed to export projects from Final Cut Pro that had incomplete stabilization or color rendering. And it's for this reason that I prefer Resolve's workflow. I feel like DaVinci makes the need for me to wait on the software clear, where Final Cut offers me an option to work around it. But the option to work around it maybe isn't as clear as it could be. So I end up waiting on the render to complete so that I'm certain the program is in a state that I can proceed. Now it's your chance to chime in below. Do you use Resolve on a daily basis? What are your favorite effects? Do you find some of the stumbling blocks I brought up with Final Cut are present in your process? Or do you think Final Cut's great? Let me know down in the comments. I admit learning a new video editor wasn't on my 2025 bingo card, but I'm already finding reasons to be grateful that I did. I also fully admit that I'm in the period where I'm a student. I'm still far more productive with Final Cut Pro, even if I find myself preferring the results when I edit in Resolve. I know this sensation will pass in the coming weeks, but right now the goal is for me to stay the course, learn the tools, and understand that a breakthrough is on the way. As always, let me know what you think down in the comments. Stay tuned for future tutorials. And as always, I hope you stay curious.